a guy in the on outskirts, outskirts of Georgia somewhere in one county doesn't know that a woman on the inner side, other side of Georgia won a case in a, a district court. Those cases are not on Lexus. So I want to work to create a database, get the movies running, and rock on. Thank you. And I think I, so. The time was, the time should be up there as to when I put it up, but I think it's around one o'clock. But uh, like I said, I share it with all the affiliates. You know, everybody like you yeah. know Neil Garfield. Uh, so, everybody. Yeah, watch that. See how many hits it gets. Ron's on some other YouTube stuff. So. Uh, you see it at three thirty a.m. That's what we, people's picking oh, stuff was. up. We, I mean, <laughs> you know. That was fired. you want to come out? I'd love to, thanks. Quite honored, actually. Share with the people about your background and, and what you've been sharing with us here yesterday. Sure. Well, basically, I'm uh, 46 years old. I grew up in Cleveland Heights, Ohio, for the most part. And right off the bat, we were engaged in real estate issues. Uh, when I was well, three, we moved to Euclid, Ohio, and my family had to use a white family uh, named the Kibbies. They were Baha'is. We used them to get into our apartment because they wouldn't rent for my father. So she says, well, my son wants to come in. So, you know, my dad drives the ball over on the corner. We hide out, you know, then he walks in. They're like, you got a black son. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> it is pretty funny. Uh, anyway, so strangely enough, uh, he and my mother, well, they also had a black son. Well, that would be me. We also have, uh, I have two sisters, but I never discuss them because I know the way that the hate mills work in this country. So um, they're off the charts later with that. Oh, no. We were able to move in, and I, I still remember the neighbors coming over. Like, they're like, they walk in, like, oh my God, it's, it's clean in here. It's crazy. You know, this is 1960, <laughs> whatever. But uh, big long story short, uh, yeah, and then in Cleveland Heights, we were part of a racial steering case, the landmark case called Heights Community Congress versus Hilltop Realty. Bless you. And in that case, basically, uh, they were steering blacks and other undesirables to other parts of Cleveland Heights that they didn't want us, that they wanted us to be in. But my family, we were the first, uh, second black family in my neighborhood in a certain area of Cleveland Heights. So there was a family home in the late 90s, I think 99 or so. Uh, anyway, we didn't have a lot of money uh, growing up. We had one car and, you know, what we did have, though, was knowledge. Both my parents worked for big corporate government type entities, you know, and uh, they gave me the opportunity to use my brain the way I want to, and that's what I'm going to do. I love photography, vintage cars, vintage motorcycles, and uh, justice. Our area was the lesser affluent. It was like the middle of Cleveland Heights. Then there was an upper strata over here where my friends from prep school went to. And that was like houses that are bigger than your bigger than a barn, you know, it's massive. But in any event, so that was my exposure to real estate stuff. My parents, they were testers. They, we, we were part of the, the, the lawsuit. They would test to go out, you know, and the study precedent that testers can get compensated when they're the victims of unlawful discrimination and redlining. So that was all when I was like, I don't know, six or seven years old, 1970, you know, 71. So that kind of set the basis that my dad was a precinct committee man, and I followed in that vein. I was, you know, state debate finalist in high school and all that, and uh, eventually, you know, went to law school at Case Western Reserve, which is back in Cleveland. Uh, I was a reporter for a daily newspaper, uh, a weekly newspaper before that. So that set my, my investigative background. And then law school, I thought I thought I would never practice. Actually, I was in, uh, engaged at the time, and my fiance and I were going to run a nonprofit for children. But uh, politics crushed that. All right, we were going around talking to schools and uh, students about isms and schisms. <coughs> And another woman, uh, Ducky Dreyfus, she thought that we were, uh, you know, kind of trespassing on her turf. She had a program similar at the other law school, so that crushed that. So I ended up practicing, and I worked for a progressive civil rights lawyer in Cleveland called Terry Gil named Terry Gilbert. Then I went to the Ohio Attorney General's office as a clerk, and then I was hired on for a couple of years there. So I spent about four, almost five years at the AG's office, I think, and then I hung a shingle in since uh, Columbus, Ohio. And I started vigorously representing the undertribe of any race, sexual orientation, whatever, bring it. You know, I was on it. So uh, I was in the paper all the time, and national, on uh, CNN, on a couple cases we had that were just nuts. And eventually they grew tired of that. So the newspapers stopped calling, you know, there weren't more interviews, and uh, all my cases kind of got relegated to the back seat, you know. So then that's how that happened. But then eventually, uh, I ended up getting suspended by 
Chief Justice Moyer, who we just saw in the video, after my friend and I, had, uh, we recorded a landlord that had called my white client a nigger lover. And we taped to this guy, uh, we taped the company, but eventually th there was not even a prohibition against it as far as ethically. And, and, and legally, Ohio was a one-party state. So they, they put me out on probation for a year, and then at the end of the year they said, well, you haven't fulfilled the terms of your probation, now you're suspended, Mr. King. So that was like 12 years ago, and ever since then I've been working in wireless and telecom and things of that nature, and learning video. And along the way, I got in trouble. I was the NAACP legal chair in New Hampshire, and this, this idiot, Kelly Ayotte, was the, the attorney general then. She's now a U.S. senator, by the way. Uh, she's one of Sarah Palin's friends, and, and, and uh, McCain and all those guys, and they locked me out of their press events, even though I'm a, an honored speaker at New England News and Press Association, okay? So I, I have them in federal court, as I mentioned earlier, so we're dealing with that right now. And that kind of brings us to this. Along the way, I was a licensed title insurance producer in New Hampshire, okay? I closed a couple hundred residential deals. And I heard about MERS at the time, and I, was, I, I thought, well, that's a great thing. And then now I come full circle and I find out what was really going on <laughs> with, with MERS and the whole scam, you know? So I feel complicitous in this, so I come here to try to help correct the situation. And I make videos, I go into court, and I file front of the court briefs that they can't stop you from doing that. They can, they can reject it, but you still put it in the record. I get the video out, I roll it, and I document the abuses, like the gentleman I showed at the start of the movie, he claimed, and then, oh, we had to get this on a DVD, because he was at the sidebar, that's how they like to do it, so the general court can't hear it. But he said, I've got the, I've got the, I've seen the note, your honor, I have the note and the mortgage, my client, Wells Fargo, blah, 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 blah. All right, look, fool. <laughs> if you had that stuff, you would have brought it to court so you could slam her. You don't have it. It's been destroyed, you can't find it, the dog ate it, all right? So I'm filing an ethics complaint on that because he affirmatively said, I've seen it. All right, so as soon as I get out of here, I think Tuesday or so, I'm going to file that. I've been threatening to do it for about a month. I've been too busy, but that's what I want to do. And so I think my main focus is here, you know, I review the cases, I read them, and then I decide what kind of movies to make about them, things of that nature. I think my greatest strength here is as a filmmaker, because I have a legal background, I have a journalistic background, and the only thing they hate worse than people like you coming into court with your arguments it's people like me coming into court with that camera and documenting it. Okay? So I am a hired gun. I will go anywhere. You pay my travel, a little stipend for me while I'm there, I'll hook it up for you. And, and that's a threat. You know, I need, time to, I need time to research what the law is on the cameras in the courtroom. And even if I get shut down, I still make the video right outside the courtroom. Or I interview people coming right outside the courtroom. There's no, I'm never at a loss for a video. And that's... The new, that's the way, that's the way of the future. We have to document the successes and the losses because even the losses are successes once you document them fully and you put them on the record, you keep doing it and they can't stop that, all right? And then we spread, you know, my videos, other people's videos, we spread them and I want to create a database eventually for all of our successes so that we can go to my website and pull them up because you could have a guy in the outskirts, outskirts of Georgia somewhere in one county doesn't know that a woman on the inner side, other side of Georgia won a case in a, a district court. Those cases are not on Lexus. So I want to work to create a database, get the movies running, and rock on. Thank you. Can you go to Washington and follow them? I did. Oh, you better believe I did. Excellent.